Good morning and welcome to the Talking City podcast. My name is Seb Pags and I'm standing in for Joe Bray today. And I'm delighted to be joined by a sun-kissed Simon Bykowski. Simon, where the hell are you? Yeah, I'm in my hotel room with the curtains drawn pretty far because the uh, the sun is absolutely streaming in. It's uh, yeah, a lovely day in Madrid. So you're in Madrid. What what brings you to Madrid, Simon? What is possibly happening in Madrid? Well, there's uh, there's quite a big game on. Um, I um, I met a lovely um, lovely man at the train station uh, because I was completely inept at buying the ticket that I wanted to buy, and uh, it turns out he's a big Barcelona fan. So so that's why we're here. Um, you know, we're here to meet football fans and. Uh, See how much they love Pep Guardiola. Excellent. Well, let's kick off the podcast with reflection from the weekend. Manchester City went to Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace are a bit of a bogey team for City. They either, I think in the last five games, City have won two of the five. They've drawn two, lost one. But Crystal Palace are one of them teams that always seem to go to go ahead against City, or they definitely always seem to score and put a spanner in the works of City's title challenge. And it was no different on Saturday, 12.30 kickoff side. Crystal Palace took the lead. Just run us through the game, run us through the, the key moments down down in South London. Yeah, it was a bit of a crazy game. Um, not really sort of the control that you usually see from City. Uh, Palace scored very early on um, and Kevin De Bruyne equalised very early on as well. I think we were 13 minutes in and it was, it was 1-1. Stones had given the ball away for the Palace goal and um, De Bruyne then just sort of pulled something out of the bag uh, after some decent play from Grealish and it went into the break 1-1 somehow despite Rodri throwing in what must be his worst half in in years um, it was bizarre to see he was like he, he passed at one point to Mateta inside the six yard box and Ortega needed to cry turn his way out of trouble Um to, to stop City from sort of giving the Palace striker the ball in their six-yard box. Um, and yeah, just he really wasn't on it and City were sort of quite good in attack. It, 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 was, a, it was a changed team. Phil Foden on the bench after his hat-trick in midweek. Oscar Bob was in, Rico Lewis was in. Um, so Pep, after saying that they couldn't afford to lose points in the Premier League, sort of wasn't afraid to... To mix it up, obviously, kind of De Bruyne and Haaland and Stones were back in, but um, it was yeah one one at half time, and it, you're kind of thinking City just need to win this game like three one. That's that that's what City need to do. Um, two minutes into the second half, Rico Lewis scores more good work from Grealish, uh, and then more good work from Grealish sees uh, De Bruyne playing Haaland for his third. Uh, City's third and Haaland's sort of first goal in a while. So that was quite, quite good. And then De Bruyne smacks in a fourth. Um, more kind of not great defending sees um, Palace get a consolation, but 4 2, um, which considering the turnaround after Villa um, was, was very, very good. Guardiola said afterwards, like, you know, they were kind of too tired to be able to defend as they normally would, which, you know, take tell what you want from that, but it did seem like they were uh, not at their best, but they scored four goals and, you know, that can only be, be a good thing for uh, for these big games coming up because you always want City to be sort of in goal-scoring form. So we've run through the game, run through what happened. Now let's take a deeper dive, side. Uh, when you saw that team sheet, you saw that Phil Foden had been benched after scoring a hat-trick against Aston Villa. What were your immediate thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, I probably just thought back to the Friday press conference where Pep was saying, I cannot afford to have any eyes on Madrid because we must get a result against Crystal Palace. And you kind of thought, well, Phil Foden looks like he's got an eye on Madrid or two eyes on Madrid and Bernardo Silva, who'd also been rested. Um, but kind of in a way, we've, we, we've said it for ages, we've been waiting for sort of this some statement performances from City and some statement wins. And, you know, not the biggest opposition, but Aston Villa in Crystal Palace in a week. So to beat Villa without Haaland and De Bruyne and then to beat Palace without your man of the moment who's just scored a hat-trick, 
scored more Premier League goals in 2024 than any other player, Phil Foden. And Pep said, yeah, we really need to win this game. You're sitting on the bench so you can be fresh from Madrid. Um, so I, it, it, it's been a really, really good week for City. And, and obviously with um, Liverpool dropping points against United, there's now just one point separating them from from Liverpool and Arsenal and uh, and it feels like they're more in the title race and it feels like they're sort of in a better position. What did you make of Liverpool's performance then? So just you touched upon that then. Um, Liverpool obviously failed to beat Manchester United to, to cement their place back at the top of the table. Do you think that Guardiola's decision to rest, shall we say, Foden for the Real Madrid game has sort of Hey, dividend given the fact that Liverpool failed to beat United is is there a sort of benefit to that in Pep's mind do you think yeah I mean you never know I, I would say you know we, we spoke to Rico Lewis afterwards um, we spoke to Jack Grealish afterwards as well he was terrific but but Rico was saying you know it, it's fatal if you drop points at this stage and on the flip side of that when you win it feels really big it feels huge and City winning as the first game put pressure on Arsenal at Brighton, put pressure on Liverpool at United. You can't say that Liverpool didn't get the result at United because City had won. But maybe if City hadn't won, they might have played with a bit kind of, I don't know, a bit more freedom or a bit less pressure. Um, it, I mean, nobody can explain how Eric Ten Hag keeps getting results. But... Um, yeah, like, you know, you sort of thought they, they might just get a result against Liverpool, you know, and uh, and they did. And and the important thing is kind of that goal difference is, is maybe out the window now. You know, if City win all their games remaining, they just need Arsenal Liverpool to draw and they will win the league by a point. So it's um, for all the talk of sort of oh, goal difference will be really important. That Liverpool result means that they're no longer three points ahead of City. They're, they're only one. So it so only needs one more slip from Liverpool for um, the City to overtake them on points, which is, again, it, it just feels like City are closer to the top. Just looking back on, on the Palace game then and looking back on um, Kevin De Bruyne's performance, you gave him a 9 out of 10. Just in comparison to his performance against Arsenal, what do you think were the notable differences between City's performance in, in both games? Obviously, Palace are nowhere near the same threat as Arsenal. We get that. But do you feel that City went into the Arsenal game a little bit com- uh, apprehensive, whereas against Villa, they were their usual selves? Or do you feel that they played the same, but Arsenal were just so much better prepared? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's difficult because Arsenal were both very prepared and very defensive. You know, they were more defensive than than Palace were and they're a much better team than Palace you know they, it feels like Arsenal came for a point and they they got a point um, and you know if they win the league with that then fair play to them but it was um, it, it wasn't a team that was kind of it was a team looking to contain rather than a team looking to sort of punish City whereas Palace tried and had success with punishing City they just couldn't they they well, they didn't have the the personnel to be able to to keep City out, and especially when it, you know it's funny because I didn't think De Bruyne played that well, but he scored two goals, got an assist, and he's won them the game basically. So where do you go? Um, it, it was one of those games that suited De Bruyne because of the the pace of it, um, and. I think there will be plenty of those games left in the sort of final eight eight games we're on now, final eight games. So I, I can see him having a big say in the in the title race. And do you think that Pep's use of, of rotation midweek against Villa has again paid dividends to that? Do you think that you'll see more of the team that played against Villa play against Real Madrid? Or do you, I mean, we'll talk about this a bit later on. But do you feel that you'll see a mixture or? Do you, do you sort think, of see that that starting eleven is the starting eleven for Tuesday night? Yeah, I think it'll be a, a mix, really. You know, you you've got to keep De Bruyne and Haaland in, and Stones, um, but obviously the likes of Foden and and Silva will come back in. I thought um, Grealish was really good, and 
he spoke to us after the game and he, he rarely speaks to us, but when he does, he's so good. And uh, we were sort of speaking about how how he struggled this season to sort of come back from the treble and to to see how he can sort of, I think he said, uh, how can I ever have that kind of happiness again, which is um, remarkably deep. And, you know, he was saying he was watching the, uh, the Netflix documentary and, uh, you know, he was getting emotional at the, the final episode in Istanbul. Um, but he said it all also made him think, you know, he's, he's, he's getting older. He, he's never, you know, he's never going to be as young as he is now. And he's not got that many years left to play in the Champions League and to try and win it again. So he, he has massively struggled sort of mentally this season. Um, and for all the kind of conclusions that were drawn from from the pitch side rant that Pep had with him after Arsenal, he said Pep has been the man who has pulled him through this season and, uh, you know, supported him when when he's really needed it. Um, he feels like he's ready to do it again and sort of go again. And, you know, he was like, I played well today, but everyone's obsessed with goals and assists. And I didn't get any, despite kind of, making four goals essentially um but i feel like i'm you know ready to to really help the team and and i think he will be really really needed against madrid tonight so um i think that could be you know a, a big advantage that city really haven't had much this season excellent well we'll talk a bit more about the real madrid game in part 3 when we preview the game we're going to take a quick break now and we'll be back to talk about Simon's travels all the way from Manchester to Madrid. Welcome back to the Talking City podcast. I've done it again, Sal, where I say city. That's really irritating. <laughs> you please the American viewers. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why American I say viewers. it. I don't know why I say it. But anyway, welcome back to the Talking City podcast. Simon, you're over in Madrid, as we've established. So let's talk about that trip. What time did you have to get up yesterday to get a flight to Madrid to get that press conference at midday? Yeah, I was going to say you sounded like it was making out like it was a bit of a trek at the end of part one, but um, but it was a bit of a trek. Um, time was I up? I was up at three um, to get a 6 a.m. flight to Brussels and then a 45-minute connection on to Brussels to Madrid, which was uh, as smooth as you can hope for in these things. And so smooth. Uh, we were a bit late landing, which meant that I had to get a taxi rather than get the train to uh, Real Madrid's training ground. But I still got there in time for uh, for their press conference with Carlo Ancelotti and Tony Rudiger, which was... And I also got there in time uh, for it, despite it being 15 minutes early. So um, yeah, I had a I had a very, very good morning of of plain sailing, really. Well, Simon, one thing I want to do now is just want to plug the sponsor for today's podcast, and that is NordVPN. We've been holding this off simply because we've been waiting for you to travel. So one thing <laughs> you weren't prepared for on this podcast is for this conversation. So I want to say it to you as if you're a listener. But did you know that NordVPN allows you to have the cybersecurity that you need when traveling and allows you to encrypt your data to make sure that if you're on public Wi-Fi, when you're in Brussels or you're in Madrid, wherever you are, that your data is safe. Now, I know that you personally have a work laptop that will protect you from that uh, generally. But but if you were traveling on your phone or on your personal devices, NordVPN could allow you to watch programs from countries that, that are generally geo-restricted. So if you've got Netflix, for example, you'd be able to log into the British Netflix if you're over in America for the city tour or, or wherever that may be in the in the summer. But listeners, if you are interested in joining NordVPN, you can you can sign up now using the link down in the description, which is nordvpn.com forward slash talking city. If you sign up to a two year plan, you get four months free. But the beauty of it is is it's completely free to try. You get a 30 day money back guarantee if you're not satisfied so yeah check that out in the description and simon i'm gonna set you up with a nord vpn account so next time you are traveling when arsenal get beat by Bayern munich and you <laughs> head over to germany 
that you can uh, you can benefit from it as well. So, but on that, what is the weather like over there at the minute? Uh, it's very very sunny. If I look this way, I'm blinded by the sun. Um, yeah, it was a bit rainy yesterday. Um, well, it was sunny when we arrived. It was a bit rainy in this sort of afternoon evening. Um, but it's a lovely day today. I can't see a cloud in the sky. Um, and it is all set to be a, a very nice day. So, um, yeah, I think it will be a, a good day for City fans before they even get to the game, which will be will be nice for them. And then, uh, and then we have the sort of the roof, which uh, was was really the, the story of yesterday that um, Real Madrid have asked for the roof to be closed. Um, at the Bernabeu. The Bernabeu has been redeveloped. Um, it's sort of all singing, all dancing. You, the pitch can be removed into like 47 different pieces and the roof can be, uh, is retractable as well. So um, it's, it's quite interesting because, you know, like when I landed in Madrid, uh, this is obviously the third time in as many years that you've played Madrid. And last year, it was so confident, like all the sort of, reporters asking questions to Ancelotti that there was just this confidence that exuded as you would when you've won the Champions League 14 times this year is very delicate like they're they're really quite hurt still by um by City beating them so badly at the Etihad and and after the game uh last year I think Federico Valverde came out and said it was the most the the sort of toughest atmosphere he's played in and one of the sort of Spanish editorials said like this is like the the Etihad I think they called it a complete trap and just said it was so hard to play and it was the toughest the harshest experience Madrid have faced in like decades Um, and so they're trying to recreate it Um, at the last game against Athletic um the, the sort of the fan group held up a banner calling on everyone to wear white against City um, tonight. So they want the whole stadium in white. And the club have also asked UEFA and City don't really get a say in it. So they expect UEFA to, to grant permission for the roof to be closed to sort of add to the noise and make it even more uh, intimidating. So, I mean, it, it's all just quite funny because, it, it you know, it's they're doing all this for City. Like City fans will just be very amused by the, you know, that Real Madrid have just turned them into this massive uh, beast that needs to be slain, which which is absolutely true in the playing sense. But it's just kind of funny for all the fans out here. But um, yeah, the the roof was on last night and uh, I was told it was kind of very refrigerated. Um, So... Yeah, I mean the the temperature will probably drop because we're we're only in the beginning of April. But um, just for anyone thinking that the roof might cause sort of sweltering conditions, I I don't think that will be the case. But um, yeah, very very interesting, nevertheless. Do you think that City will see that and go, "We want to do that with our stadium"? Because they're 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 renovating the Etihad every year by the by the looks of it. You know, they're doing the North Stand and. Do you think that City will look at Real Madrid's brand new developed stadium and go, hmm? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I think they, um, they will sort of be be seeing that and thinking exactly that. To be honest, I don't know whether they'll actually do it because every stadium's different, and you know, it's um, it's all about infrastructure, and you know, City won't have don't have the uh, retractable pitch that Madrid have, but still very happy. Um, I mean, the Bernabeu looks great. And it. I, I think the thing is City's development will put them kind of on a par with with that, this kind of like multi-entertainment venue that can be used all through the year. Um, it look, I mean, last year we were here, just like cranes everywhere and building work, but it, it looks kind of really spectacular. And I think from sort of the air, it will look, even even better it's sort of like the the biggest cruise ship you've ever seen um and uh yeah like city have kind of been working to uh, everything sort of fell into place for what they want to do 
but um, you know they will they will certainly be looking at what what Real have done, um, I, because that is the the future for for all football clubs really. Am I right to think that after the Bernabeu was closed last season when they played, the sixty one thousand capacity wasn't it? Um, yeah, but I, was it restricted because of the the work that they had going on? Uh, I believe so. Um, it's hard because it's been a long redevelopment. Um, so I'm trying to think what. Oh, 20, I'm looking at 2022, that's why. So 2022, it was 61,000. So maybe it was the year before rather than last year. Um, the stats, let's have a look. Good. Yeah, so attendance was 63,000 last in May last year. Yeah. So then. What's the capacity now? So, because I it's, thought the Bernabeu had a massive capacity. Is is eighty one now? So, 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 so that could add to it as well. Yeah, the that, yeah. The closing the roof. There's going to yeah. be eighty one thousand bonkers Madridians. Is that even a word? Spaniards in there? Ma- Madridistas. Madridistas. Yeah, giving <laughs> Madridians what a pathetic person. <laughs> Madristas, yeah. Sorry, I've I've, I've completely ruined uh, their name. I remember there was a, a a gig I went to in Manchester, and Taking Back Sunday was supporting them, and they called us Manchesterians, and I remember going mad about it, saying we're Mancunians, and I've just done exactly the same. But yeah, so just uh, with the roof closed and eight to one thousand Madristas in there, giving City hell. You know, and we, we're gonna we're gonna preview the game in the next part, but I just want to add this in: City really need to go in there and score an early goal, don't they, to shut them up? <laughs> yeah, yeah, or yeah, or or keep the ball, or do whatever. Basically, I mean, last year was bad enough. It felt like City were really kind of hanging on in the second half when they were they were one nil up, um, one nil down, one nil down, nearly going two nil down, and um, the the crowd were played a big part. Um, I know they did in the in the second leg as well, but you know the, there's a lot of talk about the second leg and sort of how City have an advantage, but they know the City know that that will be redundant if they don't survive tonight. And it's interesting that looking, at, I'm just looking back at the uh, at last season's game there. So it's the semi final. Vinicius Junior scored in the 36 minute. But if you look at the stats, having not watched the game, the stats sort of tell you that City dominated. City had 10 yeah. shots, Real Madrid had 13, but City had six on target to Real Madrid's four. City had 56% possession to 44%. City made more passes. He had a better passing accuracy and they both conceded the same amount of fouls. And it's like, I remember watching the game and it was it was very much very tense. And then when De Bruyne got that equaliser, it, it helped. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what I remember from the game is City battering them in the opening 20 minutes. And, it, and us looking at each other thinking... Yeah, we're not going to swear, but City are playing very, very well here. And but then the longer the first half went on, thinking Real Madrid are happy, Real Madrid are, are happy to let City be so dominant, and they're just sitting in and waiting to pounce. And then Vinicius scored that absolute wonderful goal, um, and and suddenly Real Madrid just then started sort of moving through the gears, sort of tightening their hold on City. Um, you know, it was like a python just sort of choking the life out of City. Um, and then they came up with a, a goal of their own to sort of break that that hold and that pressure. So it it, it was a thrilling game. And, um, you know, as as thrilling as the, the 4-0 really for, for different reasons. And it was interesting, Guardiola last night saying that he kind of expects more that type of game across both legs rather than like, you know, any team running away with it because he thinks they're a lot closer than they were last season just because City aren't coming into the game in as good a shape as they were last year. Well, that's it. And, and it's the it, it, it's the Bellingham debate as well and the fact that they've signed Bellingham. They look a lot stronger and obviously their new stadium and everything. They've, never, they've not got Karen Benzema anymore. So they've got a brand new front line, essentially. But we'll come on to that in part three. side so to end part two... I just want to talk to you about City's open training. Now, that happened while you were at 37,000 feet, travelling to travelling on your way to Madrid. But it was reported that Kyle Walker did a solo session just as the media were leaving their 15-minute window of opportunity. Simon Stone tweeted that. So 
from from now the dust has settled and the traveling squad they're probably well obviously are there so they'll have arrived last night um what what do you know what what's the latest update did you mentioned before about something about Grealish? um yeah so uh Kyle Walker and Nathan Ake haven't traveled um due to injury uh Josco Gradiol was not seen in the 15 minutes of open training that the media have on a Champions League match day. Um, he has travelled, so he is with the squad. He will be part of the squad, but Pep last night said that he is a doubt. So that kind of puts a bit more doubt as to whether he will play. So, I mean, it's just, it's it's not great timing for, for City to have three of their fullbacks um, injured at a time when they have to face Vinicius Jr. and Rodrigo. Um, but as Pep says, it is what it is. And uh, I think, you know, if Gradiol doesn't make it, you can expect Rico Lewis and Manu Akanji to, to play on the wing on at fullback. And, uh, you know, huge, what a huge night that will be for, for Rico Lewis. We've touched upon uh, Pep's presser earlier on about City coming out fight, uh, coming out fighting basically against uh, against Real Madrid. But but from what Pep said last night, was he was he a bit more fired up in the press conference than he usually is? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of you know he he almost sort of puts the war paint on the second he he steps into the room. He knows he's not um, sort of the the most loved man in in Madrid and uh, at Ancelotti's press conference one of the questions was all about how Guardiola seems trying to influence referees um, so what will what will you do to try and try and stop them with this sort of dirty tactics and thinking well, right okay good um, it started um, yeah it, it was um, it was more because kind of Rodri said look we've won the Champions League I think that's given us kind of more serenity and more composure to be able to play on nights such as this. And you think, oh yeah, 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 that that makes sense. And then Pat was kind of like, no, no, like winning one isn't enough. We've been in the Champions League, like flying the flag for ten years, but we need to do it for seventy years, like Real and other great teams in Europe have been doing. So we can't afford to sort of sit back and be happy with what we've got and also we can't afford to sit back and be like oh we've got loads of injuries so we're, we're whatever happens happens he was like we can't defend or sit in for 90 minutes against this team we need to play how we play and we need to try and hurt them and to punish them to let them know that we are ready to to score goals and you know I think that's what was missing from sort of the City Arsenal game when both teams cancel each other out but like there wasn't really that threat of I am going to score uh, or I am capable of scoring. Um, and I think, you know, that is what Guardiola wants to bring tonight. He, 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 he obviously knows the value of having the second leg at home. But like I say, you can't just kind of put all your eggs in that basket and think, oh, we're going to win 4-0 there again, so it doesn't matter. Like City need to put in a, a high-level performance tonight against you know, one of the best teams in the world. Whoever wins this quarter final is going to be kind of nailed on favourite to win. Um, and that is because Real, as well as City, are just so good. Well, I think that that's the thing as well is to remember is last season was a semi-final, so it was closer to the end of the season. There was a lot more picture painted, shall we say, than there is at this point in the season. So a lot of fans, you know, Pep coming out fighting and, and giving the fighting talk is one thing. But we're, we're sort of further away from that end goal than, than we were this time last, last year. Oh, well, when this game yeah. happened last year. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the And, you know, Real feel like they've got a lot more to play for after kind of the disappointment of last year. And I, I'm not sure where it's come from, but the, the, it was asked at both press conferences about this idea of sort of, Guardiola being a coach and Ancelotti being a manager, um, as in kind of, you know, Guardiola's a more tactical, technical guy and Ancelotti's the sort of 
the the sort of man who is able to manage the egos in the in the dressing room. And and Guardiola was like, you know, everyone talks about how amazing Jude Bellingham has been this season. He's been amazing because Carlo Ancelotti has found the best position for him. Like you you can't say that he he's not a good coach. Um or, you know, he, he's just like he just kind of focuses on other things. Like he's an amazing coach, an amazing manager. Um, and that's why, you know, he's got such an incredible record. I think someone I think it might be his two hundredth game in the Champions League or something like that. It's um he he's uh, and yeah, you do just feel whenever you come to Madrid, like you are facing the the kings of of the competition, and Ancelotti just exudes that that class and that quality and that style that City are going to have to work really hard to to get anything from. He's like a statesman, isn't he? He really, like, yeah. If you, if yeah, you say yeah. to me, give me the epitome of a Real Madrid manager. Carlo Ancelotti is the guy you described. He's well dressed. He looks the part. He's a silver fox. You know, he's he's an absolute like he he fits the mold of what you expect the Real Madrid manager to look like. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I, and and it's completely fitting that you know he's um, he he's won the most Champions Leagues. You know, Pep is is behind him um, as as good as Pep is. So yeah, you don't you don't win so many Champions Leagues um, without being an amazing coach and manager and person. And it's amazing to think we look back, what, 18 months ago when he was the manager of Everton. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is something for the history. But you know when Sky do that? Premier League. Yeah, years, yeah. Like, How the one shot yeah, Everton? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so si, we'll bring part two to an end there. In part three, before we do a preview, I've got a bit of a discussion with you that we, which we talked about earlier in the week. So look forward to that. We'll see you again in a second. Welcome back to part three of the Talking City podcast. So I want to start part three with what I call the fan debate. Now on Twitter over the weekend, I had a discussion with a guy called Andrew Wolf. Andrew, I hope you're listening because I did give you the link. And that sounds like the police are on their way, Simon, to come and take you away. Yeah, yeah, we might need to be quick with this. It's because <laughs> I've spoken about the Barcelona fan in Madrid. They want to know where he is. They want to hunt, hunt him down. <laughs> well, basically, I was having a, a, a back and forth with Andrew Wolf on Twitter. And we were talking about the idea that um, the, the strength of the City team this time, if they were to win the treble again. So he said, um, he, he was talking to a friend of mine and who was talking about the United game against Liverpool. And he sort of come, come back with the fact that um, City, uh, Liverpool basically winning the league. And I, I put, it is cities to lose by virtue that they're the holders of the Premier League. However, I imagine the first team to get knocked out of Europe will win it, as in Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal. Uh, sorry, yeah. City, Arsenal. So I then said, if City win the treble again, will this be bigger than last season's? So Sai, I want to put that question to you. And, and let me give you a bit of background on why I asked that. Is because last season, it felt like to me that that City team was, was perfect. It had, it, it had enough elder, elder players, experienced players in it, and enough younger players to bring that rotation and to have that balance through the team. Whereas this season, You've lost Gundogan, you've lost Mares. I know Mares probably wasn't as key a player as as he. I may look back on and think he was, but but I still feel he was he was a key member of that squad in terms of the full squad. And then, whereas this season, I think that the pattern of players changed slightly, and bringing in players like Doku, and then obviously a lot of the injuries that they've had, City sort of got. I don't say got lucky, but they they had a real that they came to fitness, shall we say at the right time, whereas now they're struggling with injuries. So do you think, and, and, and also, Arsenal are a lot better this season. They've got a year's experience of a title race under their belt. Liverpool have got the the added bonus of Klopp's leaving, so we need to win it for him, as Liverpool as Liverpool generally have. They sort of live on, on these little moments of, we need to do it for the manager, we need to do it for this, we need to do it for that. So 
and and also the FA Cup run I feel has been stronger this season. They've had stronger opposition, and the opposition in the Champions League has been equally as strong. So that's my perspective on it. Do you agree or disagree? Um, I think there is probably a very clear disconnect. Well, it's, it's two separate questions. I think. Is it two separate questions? Um, I, I think from it's a, a very team, long question, if not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think for fans, nothing will top last year. Um, it, it was, like you say, it was perfect, but it was perfect for only about three months. Um, <clears throat> yeah, February, uh, which is all, I, I don't think it could be perfect for sort of much longer. Oh, you know, for it to be as good. I think if you perfect the whole season, it gets a bit like not pe- people. C- people can't stay as engrossed in it if you're as good for ages. And you know, City have not lost a game since Aston Villa in December. But everyone's a bit like, well, well, you're still waiting to get good. Um, it, it felt just like City really took control, and also, you know, straight after the Premier League charges, so there was a bit of. Alvinizing there. Uh, there was Pep's happy flowers rant, which kind of really took took everyone up as well. And uh, there was just this feeling of like, oh my word, I think they're going to do it. Um, as it came creeping on, they were an unstoppable force. You know, they just destroyed Arsenal at the Etihad um, when they needed to. And then getting over the line against United in the FA Cup final, getting over the line against Inter. Like you, you couldn't have have scripted it better, I don't think, from where they were in February. And it, it was kind of even sweeter, the fact that they beat United and, you know, beating Inter as well. Um, it, uh, uh, but also beating Real and Bayern on the way. And, you know, for those fans that were in Istanbul, you know, I've sort of spoken to a few out here who have watched the Netflix show and, and they say, you know, it, it that last episode just like really gets you. Um because it meant so much to to so many people and they're just like unforgettable memories. And I don't think, it, it, it's a bit like the Premier League title. So many fans just like, there's no getting better than Aguero. And not just because of the circumstances, but because it was the first time. Um, you know, the, the first time is is always memorable. And for the Champions League being a competition that City have sort of tried to win so often and not won. Um, it was kind of even sweeter. Um, what I would say is from a team perspective, winning the treble this year would just blow last year out of the water. Um, I know you kind of have to get, you kind of have to get there um, to to do it and get over the line. And once you've got over the line, it's easier. But to do it again in back-to-back seasons is insane like only two teams in English football have ever won the treble could City do it back to back like no no one's ever come close for a reason and City have got injuries the team is not as good as it was last year um, but they're just finding a way to stay in and um, you know even like we spoke to Grealish at the weekend he's found it really tough this season mentally you don't factor that in like that's what Guardiola's been banging on about all season like He's so happy with where his team are because of where they could have been and everyone could have been like, well, yeah, you're never going to win the treble again, are you? Like, it's understandable. You're not going to reach that level. But they're, they're there. Like, it, it, it is really, really remarkable. And if they go on to win the treble, then it will trump last season, absolutely. But at, at the same time, City fans are not going to be as joyous at Wembley celebrating a second Champions League as they were in Istanbul celebrating the first because you can't kind of um, put into words how much that kind of novelty factor um, comes into it. No, no, speaking to Vernon about it uh, over the weekend, he's a season ticket holder at City. And he was saying that him and his friend have booked three hotels at Wembley, the same hotel three times, the FA Cup semi, the FA Cup final, the Champions mm. League final, on the anticipation that they get there because 
it's like it's at Wembley, so it's you know easy way to to get there, easier to get there than having to put flights and everything. But with the addition of the Super Cup that City won, and then obviously the Club World Cup sort of factored into this season. I know it's sort of in the calendar year, but also this season. They yeah. didn't have that last season. So so to win the treble this season and on top of that, the Club World Cup and the Super Cup, you know, and then hopefully they'll, they want to win the Charity Shield, which I, think, I don't think they've won recently, have they? I no, no they've, said they've, not won it. they've lost the last three or four, yeah. Yeah, but to, to win the five biggest trophies you can win in a single year is... Um, it is unheard of. It, it would just be absolutely out of this world if City managed to achieve it. Um, but at the same time, the fans will always hold Istanbul up um, as you know the their greatest moment, and that's and completely as well, acceptable as well. And and as well, this year it's twenty five years since Gillingham. Twenty five years since yeah. since that. You know, that Paul Dickov moment, as it's remembered, or the save from... Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it is. Um, and people will sort of talk about that. But I think 25 is only much more significant than 24 in like our heads. You know, last year it was like, it's 24 years since that. Or, you know, it's 20, 20 since we were last, since we got promoted to the Premier League and didn't get relegated or or whatever that is. So, um, you know, I, I don't think the fans will be like, oh, it's more special because it's 25. Um, they will just sort of view it for for what it is. But, you know, it, it will be kind of, I, I probably wrote 24 years since Gillingham last year in, in my my copy because, it you know, it, it was a thing. And, it, no, it, it will be again. But it's, um, it, I, was, I was thinking last night, actually, on the... Uh, on the Metro back, I was having a conversation with someone and um, it was like, you think back to earlier this season and, um, you know, it, it straight after City won the Champions League last year, there were sort of high, big talks in Abu Dhabi with the ownership and Pep and people. And they basically said they want to have the sort of Champions League domination um, that they've had in the Premier League for years. They want to dominate the Champions League. And that doesn't mean they're going to win it every year, but it means sort of getting to finals. And, you know, a bit like 2021, they got the final. 2022, they were kick away from the final. 2023, they won it. 2024, they they want to be there um, again. So, you know, some... I, I think because they're not as good a team this year, they've got more chance of winning the Champions League than they have the Premier League. Um, and so not winning the Premier League would obviously be a huge disappointment. But if they were able to win back-to-back Champions Leagues, that would be, again, like seriously elevating this team in the list of sort of the greatest ever teams that we've seen in football. And in addition to all of that, if they win the Premier League this season, they'll be the first team to win it four in a row? Well, yeah, yeah, that is. So, you know, if they win one of the two, then they they're getting bumped up in history. Mm. So um, there's there's plenty to, to go at, but it, it does feel like this Madrid game is is pretty mammoth, not just for the tie itself, but for what it could mean and bring. And Pep Guardiola has to keep all the lid on all of that because you guys are going to be asking those questions from now on. Is the trouble yeah. going to happen? And he's going <laughs> to snap like he snapped at Joe last year. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, yeah. side. before we bring the pod to an end then, we need to preview Real Madrid. We've done a lot of talk about this game, but let's get into the nuts and bolts of it, Si. Who is in your starting eleven? Who do you think Pep will pick? Who do you think Pep should pick? The, the two different questions, because what he who he should pick is usually who he doesn't pick. So yes. what, what are we saying? Yeah. So, I mean, I will leave out the, the most interesting position, but I think with the Guardian news, you go Lewis at right back, Stones, Diaz, Akanji at left back. Akanji did really well at left back against Real Madrid last year Um, because Ake was out for that. You go Rodri, you go Phil Foden, Kevin De Bruyne. Yes, they can play in the middle together. You have Bernardo Silva and Jack Grealish on the wings. Um, Bernardo kind of coming back to help with uh, 
you know, help Rodri uh, as well as Rico Lewis pushing up when he when he wants to. Um, although not that much because he's got Vinicius to deal with. And then you have Erling Haaland up front. In net is the most interesting because does he stick with Stefan Ortega or does he return to Edison? Edison was brilliant at the Bernabeu last year. He was brilliant in the Champions League latter stages. He saved his best performance for the final where he, he was, you know, Rodri was the match winner, but Edison was the reason that City won the game. Um, and, you know, he is the number one, but he's not played since Liverpool last month. And Stefan Ortega has been really, really good and is in rhythm. Um, I just think with everything else that City have got going on and all the defensive issues, I think Ortega probably edges Edison because you want as much continuity as possible. And, uh, and you know, he, he, Ortega deserves it. He's played really well. Um, he's done everything they've asked him to do. Um, and he's yeah he's in he's in good form so I I kind of think that might be a a, a call that well whoever he picks is going to raise a few eyebrows but um, I kind of feel like Ortega's the the smart choice. No, I agree, and I, I think it would be. I know I know football isn't about fairness, but I do think it would be unfair on Ortega, who's been. I think he's been sensational, and I think I said this to you recently that in any other team in the Premier League, he'd be the number one. Because yeah. he's that good. And he is probably the best number two in the league. Maybe Liverpool fans would say Kelleher is, but he's probably the best, the best number two, best deputizing goalkeeper in the league. And the fact that he's stepped in and you, you wouldn't know that City had a second keeper in that because he's been that good. The, you know, the 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 turns he's been doing, the shimmies that they did. I think it was it, it, it was either against Arsenal or Villa that I saw, and the, the ball was coming to him. The, the attacker was running and he basically just did a fake a fake shot basically and the, the attacker yeah. jumped and yeah. it was it looked so natural though it, you wouldn't think that that was the goalkeeper doing it you'd think it was you know he's playing five aside with his mates and he's just absolutely done him and you're like that was a very important moment in a very important game and he's just just made the guy look silly you yeah know? And yeah yeah I think if Edison's going to come back in he'll probably come back in against Luton at the weekend give him a shall we say an easier game to play but then it's the toss up of who will play in the return against Real Madrid. So whoever plays tonight, I think will play in goal in the home tie. Yeah. I, but I also think if you take Ortega out tonight, then you're saying, yeah, you're off in the summer. Because, you know, there is a contract offer on the table for him and he's not taking it because he would like to be a number one. Um, you know, if there's a chance of that at City, then great. But if they're saying, no, it's a big game, Pal Edison's coming in, then I think you're saying, yeah, you're you're off in the summer, which would be a, a big shame and you know big shoes to fill because it is fiendishly difficult to find, like you say, this the kind of best number two goalkeeper in the in the league. Yeah, and um potentially it could be shop window time as well. If you know if he does want to leave, I yeah. could put him in the shop window to to say, Well, we're gonna get rid of you in the summer. Here's your opportunity to show how good you are so we can get as much money as we can for you. On the assumption that his contract isn't ending, I haven't, I haven't checked that, but I'm assuming his no, contract doesn't come to an end. No, yeah. no, no. But um, and the next yeah. question. Oh, sorry, go on. Well, he, he came as a free as well, so any money they get will be uh, yeah. very, very much thankfully received. That's great, and 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 there'll, there'll be a lot of teams out there looking for number ones, and he is number one caliber, and and, and yeah. I don't mean second tier teams. I'm talking well, you know, well, elite teams. Bayern wanted him last summer. So that's the level you're talking about. Mm. So he might be playing against Bayern next month or later <laughs> on this month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> playing for his contract. Um, right. So before we go then, Si, to finish up, the one discussion I wanted to have with you is Bowden versus Bellingham. Now, we talked about this on a previous pod about the England setup. Do you build yeah. the team around Foden? Do you build the team around Bellingham? Because Bellingham sort of plays in that number 10. Foden's position is is around that center, central area of the pitch. We're now going to see them go face-to-face, head-to-head or whatever. Uh, how do you see this battle going? I don't if there really is even a battle there. Yeah, I mean, for the first time, I think Phil Foden's an old man in a, in a debate. He's uh, <laughs> 23. Experience-wise, though. As well. Yeah, yeah. Bellingham's 20. Um... Yeah, it's going to be really exciting. And, you know, how Bellingham will be kind of 
pushing up against the centre halves and Rodri and Phil Foden at the other end will be pushing up against the centre halves. Um, so um, I yeah, I think it will be um, it. Well, I mean, we as English media tend to speak about our English talents more than more than anyone else, and sort of Jude Bellingham is an English talent at you know one of the biggest clubs in in the world so um it, it's very exciting to see him but at the same time this has been the season of Phil Foden this has been the season of Foden saying you know what Kevin De Bruyne's the main man not this season he's not I'm going to make sure that I am the automatic pick for Guardiola and you saw that with the team selection at Palace so it's in Foden's hands because you know it, it feels like the England team is set up for Bellingham and Bellingham is the star and Bellingham is you know undoubtedly a, a generational talent but Foden has kind of never really made his made a place his own in the England team. But if you've got a guy who's outperforming Bellingham in a team that could win the treble, again, retain the treble, you would be an absolute fool not to get him into your team. And, you know, every performance that Foden delivers on, on the big stage, Champions League nights, when everyone's watching, is only going to grow that clamour for him to uh, be one of the main men with with England but you know it's it's exciting I think English football you know should celebrate tonight um I know you know plenty of teams will not want plenty of fans will not want to sort of support City um because they will because they support their rivals but like it is amazing for English football and Rico Lewis like if Rico Lewis starts have Lewis Foden and Bellingham all playing in essentially a Champions League final. I know it's a quarter final, but it's a meeting of the two best teams in Europe playing um, three young English players. It, it's amazing. And, you know, all credit must go to the people that have been involved in in developing those those talents and, and nurturing them. Um, but, you know, all, all you can hope for is that they all show what they can do. But City fans will hope that Bellingham doesn't quite show what he can do. Yeah, hopefully over two legs he has a poor game, but but saves it for for England. <laughs> yeah, summer. yeah, um, yeah. Outside of Bellingham, then who is Real Madrid's most dangerous? Vinicius Junior, I would imagine, is the answer. But but you know, where does City need to to defend, or where do they need to tighten up to uh, to ensure that that second leg is is in their hands? Yeah, I think I think if Lewis does play at, um, at right back, I think he just needs to be super careful with his positioning because when he played against Villa he was really good going forward and linking up well with Foden but it was on his side that the Villa goal came from um because he's not quite as good at at playing the John Stones role as John Stones is and you know there will be stones there to help out and cover but um I think City just need to be super on it Guardiola kind of admitted it last night he was like there's no one um, that can sort of defend against Vinicius as well as Walker can. So we're going to have to find a way. And how well they find that alternative way will probably go a long way to determining the tie. Yeah, so last but not least, since I score prediction, what do we reckon? Are we going for a one-all like last season? Or do you think that there'll be a winner on the night? I... I <sighs> Yeah, I think either one all or one nil to Madrid, and I think City would be happy with both. Um, I think if Madrid win by more than one, then it's going to be very, very difficult to turn it round. But anything else will be seen as a positive for City. I think. No, I agree. I think obviously not losing will be Pep's Pep's modus yeah. operandi. But as you say, there's no away goal rule benefit other than it being a draw. You know, there's no there's no benefit to that in terms of the uh, the second leg. So a one nil or a one all, I agree. But if City can get an early goal and silence that crowd and then defend for their lives for ninety minutes, that would be that would be beneficial. The City fans out there will obviously want to watch an entertaining game, but equally they want to come back knowing that they can take Madrid to the cleaners at the Etihad like they did last season. Whether they do. It's seldom to be seen, but me as watching it as a neutral, I, I can see City getting a draw and then beating Madrid two nil or two one at the Etihad and um, and going through to that semi final against either Arsenal 
of Bayern Munich, who also played tonight. And uh, obviously, Saka, if he's fit, will be playing another English, young English talent. Yes. On the pitch. So, and Declan uh, Rice. Anything... Declan Rice, of course. Yeah, I forgot about Declan Rice. And uh, and then Ramsdale on the bench, maybe. For... So, another, another English player that, that's, that yeah. will be shining in the summer, hopefully. But anyway, Sat, anything, anything to say before we go? Uh, no, no, just uh, very much, you know, it, it's always always big to come to Madrid. It always feels like, you know, a real a real football match and a real experience. And uh, yeah, one of those days where you feel very lucky to be doing the job that you're doing. Just the way that the sun is resting on your face now, you look a bit like Ziggy Stardust. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like Ziggy Stardust. <laughs> anyway, uh, that'll be it for t- this edition of the Talking City podcast. It is a day late simply because Simon was traveling yesterday. So we decided to record this morning from Sony Madrid. Don't forget, listeners, if you are interested in NordVPN, it's nordvpn.com forward slash Talking City. You can get four extra months on a two year plan, 30 day money back guarantee. If you are traveling and you need to uh, protect yourself, well, NordVPN is the one. If you can get a bit of discount, then happy days. We will be back on Friday to preview City's game with Luton and bring you all the news and gossip from the uh, the Madrid game. And Simon will give us a full breakdown on that. So until then, Simon, it'll be probably Joe back, but it'll be you and one other. Until then, see you very soon. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave a five-star review if you wish. And uh, as I say, we will see you on Friday. Doodle pit.